Hello everybody and welcome back to the Galactic Armory. Today is finally the day. Episode 1 of Season 2 has released. I haven't seen it yet. I'm waiting for my wife. She would kill me if I watched it without her. But we have also completed our own set of Mandalorian armor just in time for the premiere. This is the culmination of months of work. So I'm very excited to show you guys what all went into this. You guys have been amazingly supportive. It's just been unreal. Like I said, I'm very proud of this armor. There's still a lot that I want to tweak and update to it, but this I just think looks awesome. I'm sitting here editing it, just grinning like a fool, and I hope that I can provide some tips for you guys to complete your own armor, because this is just a great feeling. It, when I'm in the armor, <laughs> I'm just, you can't see it thankfully, but yeah, I'm just smiling like an idiot. It feels great. It is so much more freeing than the clone trooper armor. When I'm in that, I can barely like bend over at the waist at all, but in this I can move around a lot easier. It's not as scorchingly hot as the clone armor, and it'll probably be what I bust out if we ever start having conventions again. Thank you all for sticking with this project alongside me, uh, so I want to thank you all for that. Now this is not the conclusion of the series, it's not the finale, because I do, like I said, I do still have a lot of work that I want to put in, some updates I want to make to the armor. But I am excited to announce I will start selling raw 3D prints of this armor that you see on me. It'll be exactly what I started with, and you'll have different options as far as like Season 1 Beskar, where he doesn't wear the knee and has the different thigh plate. Season 2 Beskar, where he does wear the knee and has a different thigh plate. Things like that. So if you guys don't have access to a 3D printer, I am happy to offer my printers to you guys. Be sure and check out the link in the description for that listing. With all that said, let's get right into how we got here, starting with the raw prints. Now I got pretty lucky that there's not a lot of large pieces on the Mandalorian, so every piece, except for the jetpack, was able to be printed in one piece on my standard CR-10S printer, which has a build volume of 300 by 300 by 400 millimeters. Now I printed this in PETG, hoping it would be easier to sand and smooth, but it really wasn't. I did all the pieces in about 10% infill because I wanted some heft to them, so I went up a little bit more than my usual 5%. 0.3mm layer height, 3 inner walls, pretty basic stuff. Now printing all the pieces is really the easy part. Once we have all the pieces printed out, we need to start smoothing them out to prepare them for painting. So for the first step, I did something a little bit different than what I did normally. I'm going to be using what's called a photopolymer resin. Now basically what that is, is it's materials used in my SLA printers. The properties of this liquid are pretty unique in that when they react with ultraviolet light, like say from the sun, they will harden. That's kind of the process for SLA printing is it uses a laser instead of sunlight to cure the resin. But we're just going to pour some in a tub and use a cheap chip brush to brush it on over the prints. Now this resin is going to fill in those 3D printer lines so that it should leave us with a pretty smooth surface. If you guys remember this, I did something similar back with my Clone Trooper armor, except I used a fiberglass resin, which was just terrible smelling. This stuff is a lot better in my opinion. It doesn't have the obnoxious odor that the fiberglass does, and it'll cure a lot faster. When laying in direct sunlight, this stuff hardens to the touch in probably a couple minutes, and fully in like an hour. And the best part is it doesn't leave your garage or workspace just smelling terribly. One of the drawbacks and why I don't typically use this stuff for detail work is since it's a liquid, it will want to run into all the like recessed detail areas. So you want to be really careful on how much you apply. You don't want to accidentally pour over any detail because once this stuff hardens, it can be pretty tricky not tricky but pretty difficult to sand down but it is definitely ideal for large flat surfaces if i tried to bondo this entire thing it would take like six or seven tubes of the stuff but i was able to brush on this resin onto all of the pieces of the armor in about like 20 minutes the brown bottle that you see me using was about 30 dollars but i really probably only used a quarter of the entire thing for the entire armor so this is definitely an affordable option as well. So once I've got all the pieces coated, I'll let them soak in the sun for a good hour, and then we can move on to the next step. So welcome to the magical world of sanding. You're gonna be doing a lot of it, so get comfy. 
So the resin that we used hardens extremely well. It is very hard, which also means it's gonna be pretty difficult to sand. So you see me here using a mouse sander and a respirator for expediency's sake. I think I have a really low grit pad of sandpaper on there. Like I'm talking 60 or 80 because that's how hard this resin gets if you leave it in the sun for a long time. I haven't tried using different exposure lengths in the sun to see if it's easier to sand if you sand it when it's not fully cured, but what I did works, technically. It just needs a lot of sanding. So I go around all the armor pieces, sanding as much as I can with the mouse sander. It's gonna save your shoulders a ton of effort and a ton of ache later on down the road. Once we have all the pieces sanded, we'll need to fill in some of those sanded lines since this sandpaper was pretty rough on them. So now I'm gonna be using something familiar, the Rust-Oleum Filler Primer. It's gonna do a great job at filling in a lot of those scratches from the sandpaper. Since it was such a low grit, it's gonna leave a lot of them. And this stuff is great for just a general coverage and base coat to show what areas need a little bit more work. Again, we're back to basics using our Bondo Glazing and Spot Putty. The resin does a great job at filling in about like 80% of the print lines, but Bondo is just too good at filling in some detailed areas or specific areas that need more work. So I'm gonna go around the entire armor, just filling in spots that look a little bit patchy or look a little bit rough. Back to sanding again. This time we're gonna be doing hand sanding almost exclusively. For this, I chose a 180 grit sandpaper. It's a good kind of medium low coarseness that should be able to sand away a lot of the Bondo, but not everything. I'm gonna go around the entire armor again just sanding our little hearts away. You wanna be sure and wear a respirator for this part cause it's gonna make a lot of dust. You definitely don't wanna breathe that in. Then just take your time with it. Put on a podcast, something to just make you forget what you're doing, make you forget that you're actually sanding. More filler primer, more sanding. But this time we're gonna be using a 300 grit sandpaper so that our surface is nice and smooth and ready for painting. Now, like I said in my helmet video, here I try to go straight to gloss black, but now that I know better, I think I should have just gone with a flat black and then applied a gloss on top of that, since it's a lot easier to get a nice uniform color with a flat black compared to a gloss black, since there can be variations in the amount of gloss material that gets sprayed out of the rattle can at once. So I think using a dedicated gloss would just work better. But this reflective gloss paint is what we need for the Illumiluster, the metallic paint that was used in the TV show. It's like a chrome paint and it looks best when it's covering the black gloss. It has to be gloss to give it that reflective shine. You guys will see more of what I mean when we go to paint it. So here is the paint I was talking about. It is called Illumiluster from a company called Imperial Surface. Now back in my original Mando helmet video, I used either some Alclad Chrome or some Spastic Chrome. They were a lot cheaper than this Illumiluster. This one quart was probably like $180 if I'm remembering correctly. This is definitely not cheap. You don't need a whole lot of it to cover the entire armor, maybe just like a few ounces, but even then it's still cheaper to get something like an Alclad Chrome or a Spastic Chrome and you get like 90% of the same results. But I wanted to be totally authentic, so I loaded some up into my airbrush and started painting. Now I tried to keep a good distance away from the object I was painting, like 10 to 12 inches at least, just so that I didn't get any like uneven airbrush streaks through it. In my opinion, the armor is still a little bit too dark. I might either go over it with another coat or use a different spray nozzle one that can shoot a little bit more paint, a little bit more evenly. I don't know yet. It will take some more experimenting. There'll be more videos on it to come. But you can definitely tell like if I only paint one side, which side has the paint. It's a nice, bright, reflective, metallic looking paint. It is definitely a quality paint, just very expensive. We're gonna use it all around the Beskar armor pieces, but there are a few other pieces that are not Beskar that we'll need to paint as well. For the shin armor, for example, I'm gonna be using a satin espresso. It's like kind of a brownish color. We're gonna paint both the shin and the shin insert where you'll poke your heel through so you can actually get your foot in. For the hip pads, I'm gonna be using an ultra matte evening navy, but I feel like this might've been a bit too dark of a blue. 
I don't know, it shows up a bit more in the finished product than I would have liked. The knee, however, I'm pretty happy with the choice of color, Ultra Matte Nantucket Blue. We'll have to tape off the little side details and paint those silver later, but that shouldn't be too hard. The hand plates, I start off with just a base coat of white, but we'll weather those later since they're more of like a light tan color. First though, we're gonna tape off the little triangles and paint them a satin French blue. Now another part we have to do is the thermal detonators that go on the hip plate. Those need to be painted silver as well as wrapped in like a brown leather. So we're gonna cut off some more of the leather that we used for the cummerbund and just paint it with the same satin espresso that we used for the shin. We'll let the paint dry overnight and then we'll glue down the leather around the thermal detonators. So here's that leather glued down on top of the thermal detonators. Now we just need to give the center circle a little bit of color, just using a plain red and painting it on with a paintbrush. So we're just about ready to start putting this on. There is one thing that I learned though from my clone trooper armor that I wanted to incorporate in this build. Now that when there are two pieces of the armor rubbing against each other, it's gonna make a lot of noise. And that noise doesn't really help the costume seem realistic at all. So what I'm gonna be doing is attaching a little bit of foam to the inside of the chest piece, the piece that rubs up against the abs, and that should keep it quiet. This is the same foam that we use for the cummerbund. Luckily it has a sticky side, so we just stick it to the inside. And now the chest and the abs will not make any noise if they rub together. It's also a good way to protect this chrome paint since it's a bit touchy. You definitely don't want to set it on any hard surfaces and you wanna to try to avoid touching it with your fingers and leaving fingerprints on it. That's why you can see I have a couple microfiber cloths laid on top of the table. That's so I don't accidentally scratch the paint away while I'm working on the other side of this thing. Okay, now comes the fun part. We're gonna start putting on the armor one piece at a time. I'm gonna explain all the pieces as we go. So starting off, I've got the pants on already because nobody wants to see that. I've got a belt on since the pants were a bit too big and it'll help us adjust the height if we need to. So first I'm gonna put on the top. That's pretty easy, just need a little help zipping up the back. Next we've got the flak vest and I added a little bit of Velcro to the chest and the backside of the flak vest. That's because it needs to hold up the entire jetpack, which can be pretty heavy. So we don't want that accidentally slipping backwards and choking us or just causing us problems and falling off. So that needs to be zipped up as well. Next we'll do the cummerbund and that just wraps around your midsection, ending right below the belt line. Now here I figure it was best to start putting on the shin pieces. I have a little bit of trouble with the back, but there's actually a leather wrap that goes around that should hold it in place fine. Next, I'm just gonna slap on the two thigh pieces. These are pretty easy. They are just Velcro held in place, so they go on pretty well. Next, I'm just gonna slip on the knee before I start putting on the wrap for the left shin. Now I'm gonna put the boots on. The boots should be stuffed underneath both of the shin pieces. I had a little bit of trouble with that, but so far this is way more comfier than the clone armor and a lot more independent. So now I grab the elastic band that is gonna be used to hold the hip plates in place and just cover it up with the cummerbund. I'll slap on the thermal detonators just right onto the Velcro. So now I'm gonna put on the cape since it needs to be pretty much covered up by the chest and ab armor. I'll just throw that over my head and attach it to the top part of the Velcro. The cape is still a bit long, I need to trim it up, but that will take like 30 seconds. So now we're gonna attach the chest and the abs. This is important to make sure it has a good stick. I had it almost fall off on me, which would have been just tragic if there was a big crack in it, but I think the Velcro holds it in place pretty well. Just make sure you have a good purchase on it before you start moving around too much. So now the gauntlets, I'm gonna start with the left one, and this one's big enough where I can put my hand in first and then just slide my gloved hand through. It takes a bit of effort though, but I am able to do it just fine. The right one has a smaller opening, so I just put my bare hand through that and just shimmy the glove down inside of it. Okay, we're making pretty good progress so far. Just a few more pieces. The hand plates just go on top of the gloves. They already have the Velcro added, so I just threw some on the backside. In the Sky Costume flight suit, already had the Velcro on top of the shoulders, so I just attach them there. So that's pretty much all the armor pieces. Now we're gonna throw on the bandolier and the leather pieces from Signs Industries. This took a little bit of working to get underneath the cape, but it wasn't too bad. Okay, and now the final piece, we grab our helmet and just simply put it on. Now this is all without the jetpack. It's probably how I'll wear it most often since, I don't know, it's the most comfy and I like the cape 
on my back. I don't like having to push it off to the side. But you can see the Velcro on my back will attach to the Velcro on the back of the back plate. The back plate and the jetpack actually interlock. So it'll actually be the back plate that is attaching to the Velcro on my back. So now we just throw the cape off to one side and we have completely put on all the parts of this costume. Like I said, guys, thank you so much for your support. There's still gonna be some more videos in this build series. I've got a few tweaks to make and I've got a few ideas of fun little videos while wearing the armor. So this will not be the last time you see me in this costume. I hope you all enjoyed the series and I hope to see you all again in the next one.